third presenter, uh, who is Akshay Chaudhari, who's going to be talking about MRI reconstruction with ML and AI. Akshay, please go ahead. Thank you, Justin, for the introduction. And hopefully you can see the slides OK. Perfect. Uh, so thank you, Justin, and thank you for all the organizers for putting together this really nice workshop that really emphasizes the need of how we can come together as a community to build sustainable tools together. So I'm uh, really excited to speak here. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm excited to chat a little bit about how machine learning methods can actually enable new and improved MRI reconstruction techniques that can enable accelerated MRI. Um, and I'll be talking about the current state of the field at a high level and presenting some challenges that we face as a field and hopefully proffering some opportunities that those challenges also have. So getting into it, uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, no conflicts, but quite a few disclosures about uh, grant and research support, some consulting activities, and some uh, equity uh, stakes. So I'm sure I don't need to describe this to the audience here, but in magnetic resonance imaging, if we want to acquire some of these nice diagnostic quality images that we're so used to seeing, well, the original data that we have to sample in an MR scanner is the Fourier transform of the image. Um, which is typically referred to as a case space. And because of this relationship that exists between the image domain representation, as well as the Fourier domain representation, there's a few constraints that one always has to deal with. Um, and perhaps dramatically, we can call this something like the triangle of fate, where there's always different constraints. And one of these constraints is resolution. If we want high spatial resolution, uh, to be able to diagnose things that are small and trying to look at pathologies that are pretty subtle, we need to be able to have as much image detail available in the images that we acquire. At the same time, if we just arbitrarily increase resolution, then we necessarily give up on signal to noise ratio because in MRI, the noise levels remain the same per voxel, but as your voxels keep getting smaller, the signal in them decreases. So consequently, our signal to noise ratio goes down. Ideally, we want high resolution and high signal to noise ratio, but we also want to be able to keep our scan time as low as possible, which is challenging because if we talk to all of our clinical colleagues, we want high SNR exams, high resolution exams in the least amount of scan time that's possible. And as MR physicists, this is tough uh, to do. So this really motivates us to build new MR reconstruction methods that can allow us to sample the least amount of data, but still produce diagnostic quality images. And that really is the goal of accelerated acquisition. If we wanted to acquire this real image of a knee uh, in the axial plane, we know that this will produce some sort of fully sampled case space through the forward model. And if we take sample that case space fully, and if we perform an inverse forward transform, we'll get this image uh, with high diagnostic quality. But if we're stuck for scan time and if we want to accelerate our acquisition, we can potentially say, hey, instead of sampling all of the case space, why don't I sample only a part of the case space? And in this manner, I'll end up with an undersampled case space with some points that are missing. At this point, if we perform a naive inverse Fourier transform, what we'll end up with is an image that has either coherent or incoherent aliasing, and this will just not have any diagnostic information that can be extracted from this. So the name of the game here really is, what is the least amount of data that I can acquire, but still maintain diagnostic image quality with some novel reconstruction algorithms? And just from a terminology standpoint, if we have an object that we're trying to measure, um, we can actually simulate what the case space representation of that would be. And we typically refer to this as a forward model. And then the inverse problem is really going from our undersampled case space and trying to build a high diagnostic quality image. Where machine learning can really fit in is to be able to take common techniques that we know that have been working over the last decade or two decades and really try to use some data-driven approaches for, uh, to accelerate how we solve some of these algorithms. So one potential way one can do this is we can start off with some mass case space and we can perform a nice zero field uh, padding reconstruction, uh, pretty similar to what Efrat mentioned earlier in her talk. But at the same time, we can also use some knowledge about the physics of the system. Uh, we can generate coil sensitivity maps. And now 
the inputs to our neural networks that will be solving this reconstruction problem will be this initial zero field reconstruction, as well as some prior knowledge of this uh, forward model that we're working with. Once we have these inputs, we can actually saw, um, cast them into unrolled neural networks that are fundamentally made up of two parts. The first part is a data consistency part, which essentially tries to make sure that whatever is the output of the neural networks is actually consistent with the original data that has been acquired. In this way, if we sparsely sample all of the case space, even though there might be holes, because of these data consistency layers, we'll make sure that we don't end up hallucinating features that shouldn't be there in the image in the first place. And then following some of these data consistency blocks, we can have CNN or convolutional neural network layers that simply tries to improve the image quality based on training data sets that we've acquired. So essentially these CNN blocks help us go from these aliased images to unaliased images. And we can run this uh, algorithm in an iterative manner so that at the end of the day, the output images uh, that the model produces have high diagnostic quality. And this general paradigm might seem quite familiar because this looks a lot like the traditional proximal gradient algorithms that we've been solving for many years. The only difference is here is that instead of picking hand, um, handcrafted regularization functions, we can have CNNs perform some of this regularization in a data-driven manner. So this is one of the fundamental models of how we can actually use machine learning to perform MR recon. There's a lot of different flavors uh, of this that exists. We can have different structures of neural networks. We can have different loss functions. But from an idea perspective, most methods follow this idea at a very general level. And what does this enable? And maybe sticking with the cardiac theme that Michael started in his previous talk is, you know, typically in our clinic, if we're performing dynamic cardiac imaging, then the standard of care might be having a two minute exam that requires six breath holds. This can be pretty challenging for the reasons that Michael described. So can we actually accelerate this using some of the machine learning methods? And the answer is this is quite feasible. If we use some deep learning based accelerated reconstruction, we can have one, albeit long breath hold, uh, where we can produce very nice quality images. And the benefit here is that not only does the quality of these images improve, but the scan time improves simultaneously also. So if we kind of think back to the triangle of fate, we're actually trying, we're operating outside this triangle because not only have we improved scan time, but we've also improved some resolution too. And in general, what is really promising about some of these uh, physics-based uh, reconstruction networks is by adding some of the domain knowledge that we have about the forward model, we can actually reduce the data extent that's needed for solving these machine learning tasks. Typically, we hear this notion that machine learning requires a lot of training data, but that exists if we're sol solving problems purely in a data-driven manner where we don't know anything about what is the model of the system. But because we know things like coil sensitivity maps, we can also include relaxation parameters in our models, we can reduce how much data our models actually need. And this is just an example from some of our work where for 3D reconstruction, um, 3D undersampling, uh, we can actually perform eightfold undersampling um, with high fidelity with only 10 training examples. On the right, we see a reference image of an axial knee MR slice. Uh, on the left, uh, we see a zero field image. And in the middle, we see a 3D deep learning based reconstruction, again, solved with only 10 training cases. So it's not as if we need a massive data set of training data, uh, but because we can embed physics into our problems, we can reduce that requirement of data. However, these, these methods that we have work pretty well, um, but there's still a few challenges that we face as a broad community. So one of the biggest challenge that I see going forward is what happens when we don't necessarily have paired training data, which is the raw case-based data that we work with and the fully sampled uh, reference images. This is a large problem because MR sequences can be quite diverse in terms of what anatomies we're imaging, what contrasts that, that we can actually have, are they 2D or 3D? So it's hard to imagine a state where we'll have adequate training data for all these different permutations of MR sequences that can exist. Additionally, another big question is, what happens if there's any artifacts at test time when our 
uh, training methods have not uh, witnessed some of these during training time. How robust are these algorithms in determining and in working with these artifacts that they have not seen in the past? And I think lastly, a large fundamental challenge is when we're optimizing some of these networks and when we're reporting metrics, do we even have the best metrics to report? Do things like peak signal to noise ratio and structural similarity, which we use day in and day out, do they actually correspond to how we perceive quality uh, or how radiologists perceive image quality? So I would say these are some of the future challenges. And uh, there are a few approaches um, that the field is generally embracing to uh, answer some of these. And the first one uh, revolves around this notion of semi-supervised learning. So let me guide you through this reconstruction model that we've uh, called noise to recon. It starts with some fully sampled case space as normal, and then we can generate some undersampling mask. And with this undersampling mask, we can simulate what an undersampled case space would look like. With this undersampled case space, we can pass it through this noise to recon reconstruction model and generate some image output. Whatever output is generated from here, we can just compare it to our target image, which we know is a fully sampled data, which is generated from our fully sampled case space. And to build our supervised reconstruction algorithm, we just try to minimize the difference between this target image and the output of our model reconstruction. This is just the standard supervised learning pipeline. But what we can do in addition to this is we can actually start leveraging data where we don't have fully sampled case space and where we don't have these high quality images. So for that, we can start off with arbitrary undersampled case space images, and we can take an additional noise generator to generate realistic noise. And we can simply add this noise to our undersampled case space. And we'll simply pass that case space that is noisy through our reconstruction model. So for the same undersampled case space, I essentially have two different reconstructions. One is without the additional noise added, uh, and one is with the additional noise model. If the hypothesis for my reconstruction network is that I want my model to be invariant to noise, then I can simply enforce a consistency loss to make sure that my model reconstructions with and without the additional noise remain identical. So if we enforce that, in addition to our supervised training, our model is implicitly learning to denoise as well as solving the reconstruction problem. And in this way, we can leverage both labeled data as well as unlabeled data set. And I think this setting can be beneficial in a very limited data regime. And let me guide you through what this graph is showing us. So on the x-axis, we can look at the case of where we only have one labeled training example. So this is data set from only one patient. If we solve a general uh, supervised reconstruction task with only one example, we get decent but not spectacular structural similarity. If we use the noise as a simple augmentation step for this one supervised case, we see pretty similar performance. But if we use this noise to recon method, uh, where we can actually leverage additional unlabeled data, which would not be possible in a supervised regime, we actually get a substantial improvement in the structural similarity metrics. Um, the same observation can be seen for peak signal to noise ratio also. And generally, the benefit of this method, the noise to recon method, is in the really low data regime, where if we have only one example, our method outperforms the current methods substantially, but that uh, performance decreases as the number of labeled training data increases. So as we're going from one to two to three labeled examples, the deltas in the performance starts decreasing. So the main premise of this is it helps us perform better in a very data limited regime. And here are some example images that come out of this network. On the left is a ground truth uh, scan. On the right most is our uh, noise to recon scan, which has only seen one fully labeled image. And in the middle, we see two different comparisons. We see a supervised scan that has seen 14 fold more images. And then uh, to the right of that is a supervised plus noise augmentation, where we simply use the same noise generator that we proposed in addition to the supervised training. And in general, the image quality looks quite similar across all these images, despite our noise to recon method using 14 fold less labeled data. And what we can actually do is we can extend this framework uh, to come up with arbitrary augmentations also. So here on top, we see a general supervised pipeline. 
where we have our fully sampled case space. We can simulate some undersampled case space, solve a model reconstruction, and then we can compare it to some supervised loss based on a reference image. In addition, we can build out an, a generic consistency pipeline where we can keep taking arbitrary amounts of case space data and have an augmentation module that can augment this image in arbitrary ways. In the previous slide, I talked about how we can perform noise augmentation, but we can extend that to other augmentations of our choice too. And once we perform those augmentations, we simply enforce a consistency loss between the augmented version of the image and the unaugmented version of the image. And the reason why this framework is powerful is because now we can actually start use our knowledge of MR physics where we can simulate things like noise, we can simulate things like motion, we can simulate things like eddy current artifacts, things that we know we can model and that can uh, impact image quality downstream. In addition, we can also combine these with simple image-based augmentation such as rotation, sharing, all the common things that are used in deep learning also. And in addition, we've also described a task scheduler because we can actually start to choose how difficult some of these augmentations have to be linearly. For example, we don't want to start our network learning the noisiest image to reconstruct. We start the network, we start network training by learning a little bit of denoising and then slowly increasing that and so on. So how we schedule these can make a large impact too. And here are just some examples of how this network can help uh, in the case of severe motion that it sees at test time even though the model necessarily has not seen similar motion during training time. On the left is some ground truth image. And then at test time, we simulate what would happen if we apply excessive one dimensional motion to it. And if we use a simple supervised model, which has not seen this, we get a terrible looking image. We can use a state of the art um, data augmentation scheme for MR images called MR augment, which does a little bit better than the supervised reconstructions but still there's severe artifacts. And then the method that we propose called Vortex, which we've actually used in a semi-supervised setting with motion as well as noise augmentations, we see performs much better than the fully supervised training. Although the image is still rel relatively blurry compared to the ground truth, it still performs a lot better uh, than the supervised cases. And note that this is a large case of very large motion artifacts. So in general, semi-supervised learning helps us uh, when we don't have paired training data and if there's artifacts at test time. But there's still challenges about how do we evaluate the best metrics? Um, and I really like showing this image uh, because here are three different neural networks uh, that have been trained with three different losses, an L1 loss, an L2 loss, and an adversarial loss. And if we look at some of these metrics that are generated, we'll see that the L1 and the L2 loss networks have some of the best metrics in terms of PSNR and structural similarity. However, if we're just qualitatively evaluating these images, most likely most of us might think that this adversarial image looks the best. Maybe this is just something that we're used to seeing, but this adversarial image has the worst image quality metrics. So I think there's a little bit of a discordance between what metrics we use to score the images and how we actually perceive this. So in order to be able to address this to some extent, um, our group has released a new MRI data set that en enables multitasking with clinically relevant metrics. We've compiled around 155 cases of 3D knee MR scans where we make the raw case based data available so that we can solve the standard MR reconstruction problem. However, in addition to this, for all of these cases, we have dense image annotation uh, labels for example, we have information by classification of different abnormalities, as well as different bounding boxes that are available as to where those abnormalities occur. We also have dense tissue segmentation labels because uh, these data sets are used quite commonly to be able to segment out different tissues. So this really provides a multitask framework where we can not only evaluate image quality, but we can actually evaluate the full downstream procedure of how some of these quantitative metrics, uh, how these uh, clinical metrics are affected by different reconstruction methods. So for this, we use the quantitative double echo steady state pulse sequence. Like the name suggests, we can generate two different echoes from this QDES scan. And these two echoes are used to generate quantitative T2 maps. Um, and if we have the dense tissue segmentation labels, 
we can actually look at regional Q2 values. So this really provides a quantitative metric, which we know has biological significance to test the validity of some of the reconstruction approaches that we're looking at. And we've created a whole host of different benchmarks for this, where our metric of interest is the quality of our T2 error. We want to be able to minimize the T2 uh, differences between the ground truth acquisition and the different reconstruction approaches. And we see how different reconstruction methods um, and how the traditional metrics have poor correspondence with the actual T2 metrics that we care about. We can also benchmark this from a segmentation perspective. We can look at traditional metrics like DICE and uh, average surface symmetric distance. So we make all of these metrics and models available through our efforts for encouraging data sharing. So this entire data set is completely publicly available. All the raw data, all the images, all the models that we've trained and the code is available at this particular website and this QR code. In addition to this, we also have a deep learning framework called DOSMA to deploy a lot of image analysis models. So say you've trained an image segmentation model or a classification model, we try to make it simple to deploy this and be able to interact with some of these uh, medical volumes in a, in a nice manner that's, uh, that can work well in a GPU. So there's a lot of work that we're doing to make this available. And we also have a framework for training some of these algorithms when it comes to reconstruction and image analysis. So we're just trying to make these tools uh, available to the community. I think in the interest of time, I might skip the next couple of slides, but as a conclusion, hopefully, uh, in this talk, we've seen that deep learning can uh, improve reconstruction, and this can generally be used to improve the value that new MRI methods can have, and that new techniques are generally needed to answer the challenge of data paucity, as well as the heterogeneity of MR sequences. And I think one of the best ways to do this is to be able to share data sets, codes, and models so that we can all work together as a broader community. So with that, I'd really like to acknowledge a whole host of students who made this research possible, collaborators, as well as funding sources, and happy to take any questions. Thank you.